Hey everybody, Jason here. I know that this is probably still a little bit awkward, unusual, us worshiping together without all of us being in the building, but I just wanted to take just a couple of seconds and encourage and invite you to worship God this morning with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So let's worship together.
Good morning. Greetings from Father Hand Bible Church, from Pastor Matt, myself, and uh, all the staff. I trust this morning that uh, you are finding your peace and contentment during this time uh, in this pandemic uh, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I was thinking on that this morning, uh, I was thinking about Paul. And Paul in his own crisis in the book of Philippians said this, that I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Then he adds, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Uh, I trust, and uh, my prayer was this morning, that I, along with Paul, would be able to say that I'm content in a situation that really basically have no control over, and that my faith is that I can do uh, all things, that I can go through this crisis, God's will be accomplished in my life as Christ strengthens me. And how this is done is in verse 19, he says this, we are able to be content, we are able to uh, really press on by knowing that our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus. Uh, what I want to do this morning, I want to open in prayer, and then when I'm done praying, we'll take about a minute that you would have a quiet time yourself, and uh, ask God to minister to your heart, that you would be able to receive his word, and that God uh, again would uh, draw close to you, and his word would give you that comfort, that truly that his grace will supply all your need. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning, dear Lord, that even at times where we have no control, times where we are weak, having no strength, that we have an all-powerful God who is omnipotent and in control of all things. And I thank you this morning, dear Lord, that as your child, that you supply by your grace all of our needs, that we are able to face whatever trials come our way. So my prayer this morning, dear Lord, is not only for myself and my family, but for each family, each individual that's listening this morning. Dear Lord, that you would strengthen, that you would empower. Dear Heavenly Father, that you would embolden. And that you, dear Heavenly Father, would enlighten us and encourage us by your word that you will supply all of our needs. I pray, dear Lord, that you would bless your word this morning. Dear Lord, may it uh, really pierce each of our hearts that um, as we face, dear Lord, today and the days that would follow, that truly, dear Lord, we would be able to say that when I am weak, I am strong because my faith is in my God. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. week I read a very interesting story. The story was about a 10-year-old boy who decided to study judo, despite the fact that he had lost his left arm uh, in a devastating uh, auto accident. The boy began uh, lessons with the judo master sensei, and the boy was doing well. And uh, he was doing so well that he couldn't understand that after three months of training, the master had only taught him one move. And he went to the sensei and he asked this question, shouldn't I be learning more moves uh, by now? And um, the sensei came back to him and he said this, this is the only move really that you know 
And it's the only move that you're ever going to know. Not quite understanding this, the little boy um, just chose to believe his teacher and kept on training. Well, several months passed, and since I took the boy to his first tournament. And surprising himself, the boy easily won the first two matches. Now, the third match, a little more difficult, but after some time, his opponent became impatient with him and charged. And the boy used, all right, that one move to win the match. Still amazed by his success, the boy's now, he's in the finals. And this time, the opponent was bigger, he was stronger, he was more experienced. And for a while, the boy seemed like he was overmatched. And concerned that the boy might get hurt, the referee called a timeout. And he was about ready to stop the match when the sensei uh, intervened. And the sensei insisted, let him continue. Let the match go on. And soon after that, the match resumed. And his opponent made a critical mistake. He dropped his guard. And instantly, that boy used that one move that he knew to pin his opponent. And the boy won the match and won the tournament. He was the champion. On the way home, uh, the sensei reviewed every move in each of those matches that his opponents had done. And uh, then uh, the boy summoned up the courage to ask the question that was on his mind. He says, Sensei, how in the world did I win that tournament with only knowing one move? And the sensei came back to him and he said this, you won, all right, for two reasons. First, you almost mastered one of the most difficult throws in all judo. And second, the only known defense to that move is for your opponent to grab your left arm. The boy's weakness ended up being his strength. I tell you that because this morning... I know we've heard a lot of messages on being encouraged and so forth, but this morning I want to talk about, in the midst of our weakness, finding the strength that we need in the days that we are in. And I entitled the message, Let the Weak Say That I Am Strong. I want to tell you another story. Years ago, a group of five Washington, D.C. area pastors called on the then President uh, Truman during the Korean conflict. They have been preaching on Isaiah 2.4, probably a familiar verse. It says, that verse, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not rise up against nation or take sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, of course, they were anti-war and they were there to press their point with President Truman. Now, Truman, if you understand, it was going to make his point also and was going to make his case for the Korean conflict. And he ended up saying, why don't you preachers ever preach all the Bible? And then he turned to Joel 3.10. Now, here's a verse that most people don't know. Joel 3.10 says this, beat your plows and your pruning hooks into spears. And let the weak say that I am strong. See, the pastor's passage that they use in Isaiah 2-4 talks about God's rule on earth when Christ himself will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And there'll be peace over this globe. But Joel 3-10, the verse that Truman quoted to those men, talks of the rage of Israel's enemies against God's people before Christ returned to earth, before he established his kingdom. And Joel was talking about so universal will be the hatred, so universal will be the rage that the weakest will fancy themselves strong enough to invade Israel and to come against God's people. That verse says they will forge weapons, they will seek after weapons for that warfare, but they will only perish in the attack. But that phrase at the end of that verse, let the weak say that I am strong, can be applied to our Christian lives. And I have used this verse, and I've heard this verse or this phrase 
used many times by pastors and other believers. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, refers to this truth in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Most of us, or many of us, are familiar with this famous passage. Uh, this is dealing with Paul's thorn or affliction in the flesh and how he prayed three times for God to remove it and that God chose not to and proclaimed to the Apostle Paul that his weakness would be turned into his strength as he relied upon the grace of God. But you find these words in verse 10. Paul says this, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The same phrase, the same principle that you find in Joel concerning the enemies of God is the principle that Paul proclaims here in the New Testament. Now, thinking about this this week, I'm going to give you three challenges. Uh, challenges that uh, really I've given myself that I need to heed. And three challenges that each of us need to heed uh, that we would be able to have the strength that we are going to need in these days. I I'm sure I don't have to remind anyone that we're already in the, uh, the eighth week of the time that we have not been able to meet together. And uh, it is becoming more difficult for many people uh, in the midst of, of this confinement. So let me give you these three challenges, and I pray that you would take them. The first challenge I want to give you this morning is do not be discouraged by your weakness. Do not be discouraged by your weakness. See, our tendency, I believe, when facing times of trial where we have little or no power to control our circumstances, is to become what? Is to become discouraged and depressed. And this is especially true if the period of time for that trial or series of trials seems to go on and on and on. Now, many of us, we're good, all right, in the short run. If a situation doesn't last too long, we we can weather it. We can get through it. We can, uh, you know, have the inner strength that we can face whatever we have to face. But when a situation continues on, like the situation that we are in, here's where we get uh, into trouble. Here's where we come to the point that it's easy for us to get discouraged and depressed. Now, how do you keep from falling into that trap? Let me give you two truths that you need to understand. All right, again, the challenge is I cannot allow myself to be discouraged in the midst of my weakness. Truth number one, to become tempted uh, in our weakness, to give in to despair is common to everyone. See, our tendency many times is to think that I'm the only one experiencing this. You know, I'm, I'm you know, in this weakness, I'm getting discouraged and despair. But others, they're able to get through it. Well, uh, that's not the truth. This temptation is something that we all face, that we all have to deal with many times in our lives. Even the strongest in faith, I don't care how strong your faith is, whether a pastor, whether uh, a Sunday school teacher, an evangelist, whoever we are, no matter how long we've been saved, we're going to have to fight this battle. Let me give you two examples. The first example I want to give you is the great prophet uh, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. If you have your Bibles, you might turn back there. Now, if you understand anything about the story of Elijah, you understand that he has gone through, by the time you come into the end of chapter 18, a three and a half year period of drought. This drought was God's judgment on Israel. This drought was God's judgment on King Ahab. Three and a half years. Now, when you think about three and a half years, all right, compared to eight weeks, all right, we are not facing anything like Elijah had to face. Now, when you come to the end of chapter 18, all right, you end up reading how Elijah 
at the end of this three and a half year period, experiences a great victory on Mount Carmel, where he called down fire from heaven. And it was at this great victory that he literally faced 850 false prophets. Let me read a couple verses. In verse 19, he said, uh, Elijah said this, Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel. This is the end of the three and a half years. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Bring them all, all right? We're going to have a confrontation. Then you go into verse 36. And Elijah builds an altar and he prays this prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then in verse 38 it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. A great victory. Three and a half years, all right, again in a great trial. All of a sudden now, it's like immediately Elijah is on a great high. He ends up after this, proclaims an end to the drought, and probably thinking in his mind, now life can get back to normal. But not so quick. You end up reading in 1 Kings chapter 19. The queen at that time, a woman by the name of Jezebel, makes a promise. And you read of that promise and that message in verse 2 of chapter 19. Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. What had happened? Elijah had all 850 of those false prophets executed. And Jezebel writes back and says, That's exactly what's going to happen to you. You mark my word, she says, within 24 hours, you will be like them. So finally at this time, after three and a half years of trial, trusting God, Elijah basically ends up, enough is enough. I can't go on. He ends up running and giving in to his fear. And you notice what he asks of God in verse 4 of chapter 19. After he runs a day's journey into the wilderness, he sat down under a tree and he prayed that he might what? Die. Just take my life, let me die. He says, it is enough. I, be, I went through three and a half years, all right? I went on that mountain, the great victory, and now I'm in a situation again. It's enough, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah basically said, I don't have the strength to go on. I, I can't go through this again, Lord. So you consider the example of Elijah, great prophet of God. Again, face that temptation. Let me give you another example. The example is Charles Spurgeon. The great English preacher was known as the Prince of Preachers. At 22, Charles Spurgeon was the pastor of the largest church in London. He preached to a multitude of thousands every Sunday morning. One day, some pranksters came to that service, and they yelled fire. Caused the panic, seven people within that congregation were killed, and many others were severely injured. That experience, along with all the pressures of ministry in that large church for a young man, then his family life, caused the beginning of Spurgeon's battle with depression. And as years went on, it became worse. By 33, his health started to fail. Uh, pain was his constant companion. He had kidney disease, he had gout, he had rheumatism, kept him from preaching. He was only able to preach, all right, two-thirds of the time. One-third of the time, physically, he could not preach. So intense was his depression, let me quote what he said. He said, my soul chooses strangling rather than life. I could readily enough have laid my violent hands upon myself to escape from the misery of my spirit. 
He literally said, I'm going to take my life. Things are so bad. Now, this is what I tell you. If this could happen to the great prophet Elijah and to the prince of preacher Charles Spurgeon, do not say this morning, that can never happen to me. I've been a Christian long enough. I'll never get to that point. You need to understand we're all tempted in our weakness to become discouraged. But let me give you the second truth. In the midst of our weakness, we can choose, all right, to take pleasure in the trials that God allows to come our way. I had read the verse all right, that uh, the Apostle Paul gave us in 2 Timothy chapter 12. And I want to read the beginning of that verse again where Paul says, Therefore, I choose, I add those words to myself, to take pleasure. Take pleasure in what? I'm going to take pleasure, Paul says, in my infirmities. That literally means his weakness. I'm going to take pleasure in the weakness that I have in my body, the weakness that I have in my spirit. I'm going to take pleasure in that. I'm going to take pleasure not only in infirmities, but also, he says, reproaches. Now, reproaches is talking, are talking about insults, contempt that he meant as a follower of Christ, even in this pandemic that we're in. If you post something about relying on God, many times you're going to get somebody who's going to come against you and insult and come against your faith. And, of course, the Apostle Paul faced reproaches constantly. He says, I am going to take pleasure, all right, in those reproaches when they come. I'm going to take pleasure, he also says, in want. That's talking about needs. Paul says that there's going to be things in my life that I feel I'm going to need, all right, and my back is going to be pressed to the wall, but I'm going to take pleasure in it. And then he says, I'm going to take pleasure in persecution and distress for Christ's sake, talking about suffering. See, what Paul is telling us is that just trying to endure pain and trials is not enough to gain the victory. I just can't say, you know what, in this pandemic, all right, eight weeks, but I can just keep on gutting it out. I have a, I'll have enough inner strength that I can do it. Paul says that's not enough. You might be able to do better than this one or that one, but you will not be able to gain the victory by just trying to endure the pain. We must understand uh, what the Apostle Paul discovered, that our faith cannot only enable us to bear suffering, it can enable us to rejoice in the midst of that suffering. To be well pleased, as Paul puts it, uh, to be able to smile, if I can say it this way, through our tears in the midst of our weakness. Now, of course, when I read the Bible, immediately I read that and I go, how? How in the world can I do that? You know, after eight weeks in a pandemic and uh, what Paul faced, how in the world can you end up smile? How can you take pleasure in what is going on? And I think the key, if you look at this, is to understand, I need to see, you need to see, Paul understood he needed to see, our trials not as burdens to be endured, but as opportunities. Let me say that again. I need to see my trials not as a burden I have to endure, but as opportunities. Now, you might ask, opportunities for what? Opportunities, number one, to give our Savior glory, making his power and strength known. This week I came across a verse in John 17, 4, concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. He was praying his high priestly prayer before he would face the cross, and he said these words, I have glorified you on earth. I have lifted up your name. All right, my question again, how? And he says these words, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. In other words, I stayed the course. I accomplished your will. I will go to the cross. I will pay the price of redemption. And he says, in this way, I glorify you. See, our trials are opportunities that we can show that our faith is genuine, our God is real, and we can give him the glory and honor so richly he deserves. I'm saying, see your situation as an opportunity to give our Savior glory. Also, you need to see it as an opportunity, 
All right, to gain the favor of Christ. To gain the favor, to bring a smile on our Savior's face. You know, Paul talked about this at when he was getting ready to face his death in 2 Timothy. In the last chapter of that book, he talks about, I have run my race, I have uh, kept the faith, I have finished that, that race. And uh, he understood that in doing that, that he will hear, well done, thy faithful servant, and he will receive the reward. I'm saying that I need to see as an opportunity that I am able to show my God how much I love him, how much I trust him, and that I, again, would gain his favor. So my first challenge, don't be discouraged by your weakness. We all face it. Paul faced it. Elijah faced it. Charles Spurgeon faced it. But we need to see it. Opportunity. Opportunities to give my God glory. An opportunity that, again, I may obtain the favor of my God. Let me give you another challenge. Challenge number two. Do not excuse yourself because of your weakness. Do not excuse yourself because of your weakness. See, I think there's another tendency we have when we face crisis and we face pain is to use our weakness and pain as an excuse, all right, to, ex to excuse ourselves. Uh, we use it to excuse ourselves in our battle against sin. We end up sinning against God, violating his word, and we end up uh, in our minds, we, uh, we excuse ourselves by saying, well, well, God knows my situation. God knows I'm weak. God knows what I'm facing. But he knows my heart, too. And, and he'll forgive me. And we use our weakness as an excuse for sin. We'll excuse ourselves in the battle against Satan in this world. Um, the time when we should be taking a stand for God, we back up. We say, well, I just don't want to draw any attention to myself. I don't want to make things difficult. I'm not strong enough to handle that. We excuse ourselves from doing God's work. How many times have I heard people say, well, I'm not really gifted. I, I, I really can't do that. I really can't. Sir, I have nothing to offer. We must understand that our personal weakness is never an excuse for sin, compromise, or not serving our Lord. The illustration in my mind immediately went to a mission trip that I did now several years ago. And one of the young ladies from our church by the name of Jennifer Wisham, all right, who uh, again has a handicap that she faces and uh, wanted to go on the mission trip. And my first thought was there was no way she would be able to do this. I don't have time to give the whole story, but not only did Jennifer, all right, go on the trip, not only was she able to do it, she probably was the greatest blessing of anybody who went on that trip. Uh, so many times we look at ourselves and we look at others and we look for the weakness and say, well, that's an excuse that God can't use us. But can I say this? In God's wisdom, our Lord uses the weak to glorify his name. Aren't you glad of that? Listen to these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in starting in verse 27. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. Oh, I, I have that circle. He's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in God. Let all glory, all right, be brought to him. See, the reality for all of us is our flesh is weak. We are all weak. That is why I can't find anywhere in the Bible it tells us to serve in the power of this flesh. Paul's admonition in 2 Corinthians 13.4 is how we are to serve. 
And this is a verse I, I would just urge you to underline and to uh, read again and to allow God to drive this truth home into your heart. Listen to what Paul says. Again, this is the passage that we've been looking at. All right, that Paul talks about glorying, all right, in his infirmities and reproaches. But he goes on, all right, and in verse 13 he says this, For though he was crucified in weakness, talking about Christ, that when you look at the crucifixion, he had the appearance that he was weak. He was crucified in physical weakness. Of course, we understand that no one took his life. But when you looked at him, it looked like he was weak, out of control, and there was nothing he could do. But yet the verse goes on, yet he lives by the power of God. He was not really weak because he had the power to overcome the grave. And now we know has all authority and all power. And that verse goes on. It says, for we also are weak in him. That means we also appear weak just as he did. See, the world would look at us and say, we're nothing. You have no power. There's nothing you can do. But just as he appeared weak and was not, the same truth, all right, applies to us. Because he says at the end of the verse, but we shall live with him, how? By the power of God towards you. Just as Christ appeared weak, but in power he conquered the cross and the grave, we appear weak. We can look at ourselves in the mirror and we see ourselves as weak. But God says you are not weak. God says by the power of God, you can face uh, whatever comes your way and accomplish my will. That being true, we never have an excuse of turning away from serving him or living in such a way that pleases him. No matter how severe the trial or how great our apparent weakness is. So I've given you two challenges. Number one, don't be discouraged by your weakness. Challenge number two, don't excuse yourself, all right, at this time because of your weakness. But let me give you a third challenge. Strengthen yourself in the midst of weakness. Now what I want to do in this challenge is look a little bit at Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, that's the faith chapter many uh, believers refer to it as. And it lists the heroes of our faith. And then as that chapter all right, is coming to an end, in verse 34, you find this phrase, out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness were made strong. The list of overcomers. All those champions of faith that we find in Hebrews chapter 11 really were all people of what? Weakness. They weren't superheroes. It wasn't that they put on some kind of cape or had all these extraordinary uh, abilities. But in their weakness, they were made strong. And this chapter explains, all right, how they were made strong. They were made strong in many cases, to experience great victories for God. God empowered them that they would be able to accomplish things that lifted up his name. You read this in verse 32. The writer says, what more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, also of David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. They received strength to accomplish great victories. This is where many believers stop reading, all right, Hebrews chapter 11. But also it mentions God not only empowered men and women to obtain great victories, but he also empowered men and women and out of their weakness made them strong 
to endure great trials and great suffering. See, I, I wish I could say that, you know, for God's will for all of us is that we would uh, accomplish these great victories, all right? Uh, and that, uh, again, that God would use us and glorify in His name that way. But sometimes God chooses to use us to show the reality of our faith in enduring and going through great trials. He gives us the strength to do this. God gave these men and women strength to bear suffering that to us would be unimaginable. Listen to what it says as he goes on in uh, that chapter. He says, others were tortured. No victory, they were tortured. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial mockings, scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And then he adds this verse in verse 39. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. He said they all had a great testimony. Some a great testimony in what we would call great victories of faith. Others a great testimony in enduring great trials that the truth of their faith and the reality of their faith would be shown. And I'm saying that we, at this time, we need to strengthen our faith, and that's our challenge. And I want to end this message by giving you five truths, I'll have to give you kind of quickly, of how you can strengthen all right, yourself in the midst of weakness. Number one, allow your sense of weakness to drive you into total dependence upon your God. See, many times God allows situations to come in our life to bring us to the end of ourselves. To bring us to a point we have no plan, we have no strength, we have no control, we don't know what to do. But it's at these times we need to see ourselves in our weakness in order to be strong in Christ and we need to cast ourselves in total dependence upon him. This was the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Again, 2 Timothy, ready to die. In verse 16, he said this, At my first de defense, no one stood with me. Everyone forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Then he adds this, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Paul said, I had to come to the realization, I cannot be codependent upon others. I cannot allow my faith and strength to be dependent upon other people. Sure, they can minister to me, they can encourage me, but my strength, my dependence needs to be upon my God. And so I would say, number one, allow your sense of weakness to drive you total dependence upon your God. Second, allow your sense of weakness to make you earnest and persevering in strength for the prayer, all right, in prayer for the strength you need. Be earnest in persevering in prayer. Not only do I need to see myself total dependence upon God, but I need to understand I need to be in prayer communication uh, with God. And the model is the first church. You might remember in the beginning of Acts chapter 1, uh, of course, the Lord's going to tell them that there are to be witnesses throughout the world, all right? And these men are going, how in the world can we do that? And he gives them the promise in chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And if you read that chapter, the response of those men and women is they returned to Jerusalem, went to the upper room, and it says they went and they earnestly prayed in supplication praying for the promise that Christ, all right, gave them, that they would receive power. And then you go into Acts chapter 2. What happened? The Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. God's faithfulness to his promise. I'm saying we not only need to see ourselves in dependence upon God, 
but we need to pray in faith, believing, all right, that God will give us that strength. Number three, allow God's word to provide you the encouragement that you need for that strength. Pastor Matt last week talked about that, gave us the challenge this week to be in the word of God. We not only need to see our dependence, not only to be praying, but we need to be in God's word that the Holy Spirit, all right, would encourage us by those truths. Fourth, you need to believe that God will be faithful through those promises. What good is it going to be if I read God's word, but yet I don't believe he'll be faithful to the promises that I read, the promises that he gives? We need to believe that God will be faithful. I like what Paul says in Philippians 4, 19. My God shall, not might, not could be, not maybe, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We need to believe that God will be faithful to his promises. And the fifth thing, you need to step out in faith. You need to step out in faith. Whether you feel like it, whether you don't feel like it, in your weakness, you need to step out in faith. That's why Paul said, my theme verse for my life, Philippians 4.13, where he proclaims, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's saying, in my weakness, God will meet my needs. And wherever the will of God leads me, the power of God through Jesus Christ will strengthen me. And I choose to step out trusting that God will empower me step by step as I walk in his will. So this morning, my three challenges to you are, number one, don't be discouraged by your weakness. No matter how strong your faith is, there's going to be times where you're going to be tempted to be discouraged. Times where you're going to be tempted to say, I, I just can't go on. But understand, we all face that because of our flesh. Our flesh is weak. But we have a God who is strong. And we need to see these times as challenges, opportunities that we can give the God the glory so richly deserves. Second challenge, don't excuse yourself. I believe in this time of pandemic, God is giving all of us unique opportunities to display our faith to our families and to others. And we need to recognize those opportunities and to seize them. And number three, you need to strengthen yourself in the midst of your weakness. When the day's coming, you just, you know, you, you don't even want to get out of bed. You don't want to face another day. You need to let that weakness drive you into dependence upon God. You need to go to him in prayer, be in his word, choose to believe that God will be faithful to his word, and to step out by faith and say, I can face whatever comes my way because my God is with me. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, Dear Lord, the prayer I pray, dear Lord, is not only for those that are listening to me, but for myself. Dear Heavenly Father, many times in situations that we find ourselves, dear Lord, we, our weakness becomes so apparent to us. And because of this weakness, because of this lack of control, we, we so much just want to put our hands up and say, enough is enough. I can't go on. We want to be like Elijah. We can feel like Charles Spurgeon. I just feel my life, I just want it to end. But help us to understand, dear Lord, that you have the power, dear Lord, to help us to go on. And that these are but opportunities that we can give you the glory you so richly deserve. And I pray for each one, dear Lord, this morning that's listening. Dear Lord, that you would drive home to all of us each day. We are totally dependent upon you. That we would be like Israel when Moses prayed, Lord, if you don't go with us, we can't go on. We need you. 
And dear Heavenly Father, we confess this morning we need you. And we lay ourselves before you, dear Lord, in prayer. Praying, dear Heavenly Father, that you would speak to us through your spirit and your word. And dear Heavenly Father, that we would take those promises and that we would believe that you are faithful. And then we would step out trusting you. And that we would have the experience of what we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. That God will be true to his word. God will give us the strength to go through whatever we face. And the time, dear Lord, when it comes that we are able to get together again. That we would be able to share testimonies of how you brought us through whatever situation we were uniquely in. And that you would be glorified as never before. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you and may it bless you and your family. And my challenge would be to you this week, again as Pastor Matt, that you be in the Word of God, but also in prayer, casting yourself in dependence upon Him and allow Him to do what you cannot do alone. God bless.